Hey, I'm David Adelsheim. The story of Adelsheim Vineyard began in 1971. That was the year that Ginny and I decided to risk our life savings on a piece of property in Oregon's North Willamette Valley. Looking back now, we were one of just 10 families that made wine before 1980 from grapes planted on our properties in that region. To celebrate the 50th anniversary of what became our first vineyard, we wanted to tell our story. But we quickly realized that the only way to truly tell our story was to tell the stories of that entire first generation. Our winery team proposed an idea, a series of video conversations with the founders of those first 10 wineries and me. I loved it and set to work contacting my old friends. In each interview, we wanted to go beyond their widely known histories to discover who these people really were and what led them to build our uniquely collaborative, and at least from today's perspective, incredibly successful wine industry. This is our shared story. In some ways, Nancy and Dick Ponzi's entry into the business of wine in Oregon sounds very similar to ours. As Nancy wrote in her 2010 cookbook, it started in the 1960s. If you weren't alive then, it's difficult to relate. Young people such as Dick and me were searching for roots and a path was presented by going back to the land, to basics and self-reliance. I wanted to better understand how back to the land translated into starting one of Oregon's legacy wineries. Nancy and Dick agreed to meet with us on October 14, 2020, outside their original winery next to the home they built. Thanks for letting us visit today. I haven't, I haven't been here in this part for, I can't even remember when I was last here now that the winery's moved away, but right. uh, do you have time to sit down and chat a little bit? We'd love to. That Especially be... if you have a glass of wine to go with. Ooh, well, I, I love this. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. I think the first thing we ought to do is have some wine. I toast. Okay. <laughs> Salud. Salud. Yeah. What are we drinking here? Well, 2012 Pinot Noir Reserve. Yes. Well, we're in this beautifully manicured place with old bottles and some newer bottles and cookbooks, early label. <laughs> this is all laid out for our conversation, I think. Okay. I've got some questions for both of you and then for each of you, and uh, we'll, we'll see how this all works. I've heard the story of, Dick, you building rides for Disneyland or some version of that story, and certainly the home winemaking and the back to the land story, but nothing ever before that. I know <laughs> you had lives before. There was, I keep telling Nancy that I had a life before her. So you're right. And now you verify that. That's yes, good. Thank you. Okay. And Nancy, before Dick, what was. I mean, did. <laughs> where, where, where was I? Where were you? Why, why did. I mean, you guys, your backgrounds are not really tied together in any magical way. I Absolutely not. Um, I mean, Pat and Joe Campbell went to high school together, I mean, a couple of years apart, but they were there at the same time. But you were in different parts of the universe, weren't you? Where did you grow up? Well, what I year? started out in California, in Southern California, uh, near where Disneyland is now. Uh, and uh, I lived there until I was about 10 years old mm. in a very kind of normal working class home. Uh, my dad worked, he drilled oil wells. He was not the owner of the oil wells, he was the worker on the oil wells. Mm. 
and he worked away from home, so my mother ran the house, and I had a very older brother and sister that I didn't see much, and it was just delightful. And then when I was about 10, my father decided he would like to be, uh, look to be a re to retire someday. And he had an opportunity to, um, at that time, this was 1952, um, that, uh, Venezuela was booming with oil at that time. And he had an opportunity to go work there. So he did. So my family, my mother, my father and I moved to Venezuela. I had no idea about this. Really? really? <laughs> <laughs> and they remained there almost 10 years. I mean, you know, back and forth. Um, I went back and forth more than they did because the schools, even in Caracas at that time, there were no adequate schools for English speakers and I couldn't go to school in Spanish. It wasn't that good. And um, so I went back and forth. To Southern California. Sometimes I went to Southern California. I went to Texas. I went to Arkansas. <laughs> I, um, I wasn't a very uh, obedient child. Ah. That may <laughs> lead to the next part of the story. Was wine part of you growing up? Absolutely not. The only word I ever heard was wino. And um, my parents occasionally had a drink, like at on, on a holiday or something. Yeah. No, the alcohol was not part of our life at all. Uh, Did we, you drink wine before you met Dick? Not really. <laughs> I drank a so lot of rum. <laughs> <laughs> So, Dick, your story with Italian immigrant parents, wine was certainly part of growing up. Yeah. And this was in? This was in Pennsylvania. And uh, my parents uh, immigrated from Italy you know, during the period of the major immigration, early 1900s. And uh, I was born in Pennsylvania in a coal mining town. Mm -hmm. and, um, in Western PA. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right, Western. And um, as far as wine, the, the tradition, as most people have become aware of, is that the immigrants wanted to bring with them that, that uh, culinary bit of winemaking and whatever foods they had, so they would make their own wines. Even during Prohibition, they would make their own wines. And <clears throat> at that time, the source of fruit was California. So uh, the memories that I have is uh, where the, in the fall, that was one of the major functions was to get the families of the neighborhood. It was an Italian neighborhood in Pennsylvania. And they would go down to the train yards and pick up their tons of fruit that they would get coming out of California. And it was always, I remembered this, because they, they wanted to create what they remembered from Europe, basically. And they understood Muscat and Zinfandel, which was the blend that they made, I guess, to, to make the style of wine that they're accustomed to probably trying to duplicate something from Burgundy or something, or from Chianti. Chianti. So that was, uh, I was raised in that household, uh, garlic, olive oil, and wine. And uh, the, the period of winemaking in the fall was always uh, a very festive event. And I, and I remembered that odor of fermenting juices. So it was, uh, it was a pretty indelible, experience. But after you left home, went to college, got an engineering degree, I believe. Yes. Before what we know of as Ponzi Vineyards, did you continue that in any way? Was there winemaking going on in your life sort of between those two things? Well, the one thing that I really remember, I mean, when I took a job in California and uh, in aerospace, I, uh, I says, great, I'll be able to 
buy some great wines and never have to make homemade wines. Because invariably, the homemade wines ended up to be uh, a, a beverage that would use it with your salad. <laughs> <laughs> on the salad. On the salad. It never was a, a great experience. I never developed a palate for <laughs> great wines. But I knew about California, and that's where I wanted to go after graduation. So just went to California, went west. And got a job in aerospace. And were you drinking? I mean, you were buying wine and drinking it and getting excited about that idea? Oh, yeah. That was, uh, that was a time when I could afford good wines, and uh, in addition to California wines. So, yeah, it was, it was always, as I remember, it was always part of our beverage when we married. Oh, we yeah. drank wine. So, so it was, uh, it was, again, trying to uh, take that experience to our new home and our, our uh, family. And you, the two of you met in Southern California then? Yeah. Um, I had gone uh, after I finally graduated from high school. Um, I went to the University of Mexico in Mexico City for a couple years. And then um, my father suggested it was time for me to go back to California. So I did and uh, kind of tried to get a job. Not very, nothing interesting. <laughs> and, uh, I, was a terrible, I was a terrible waitress. I, I got fired from those jobs. <laughs> so, but um, in the meantime, I had girls from, uh, friends from Latin America. And uh, some of them lived in this boarding house in Los Angeles that was actually a convent run by nuns. And um, they put on a little Halloween party. Uh, I went to the Halloween party. And it turned out that Dick had a friend at where he was working whose girlfriend was, had, was living there at the convent. And so Dick came to the party, and that's where we met. And was a long time before you ended up getting married? Not that long. I don't know. A year. Oh, probably a year at the most. The memory escapes me. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I realize we're going back a few years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what year were you married? Uh, 1961. We're getting close to the period of recorded history of mm -hmm. changing jobs, <laughs> working for a startup. And that was an engineering startup, right? That provided, was a consulting engineering company of some kind? Well, uh, Oh, there were a few other adventures few. in between Got that. It. Okay, I'm conflating yeah. two things, yeah. <laughs> uh, there were several ventures other than aerospace when we moved. So we moved from LA up to San Francisco, the Bay Area, closer to the wine region. But, uh, and, and was that why you moved up? No, not particularly. It just opportunities were up in the San Francisco area. And um, we started raising our family, and uh, I eventually did a lot of little venture projects, uh, mainly because we had some benefactors that would provide us with that. Uh, I, th I think they're called venture capitalists now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the cap anyway, the, the ventures that, that we were involved with took two or three years, but in the meantime, uh, we were in the Bay Area, close to, to the wine region, and um, uh, that's when I took the position at uh, Disney, which was a, a, a subsidiary, really, because I was involved with the rides and not the filming at all. So that was kind of enjoyable. It was, it was a fun project for me because we were raising our children about the same time. They were all born in the, in the Bay Area. And it was fun to have them come to where I was involved with all of these crazy things that Disney was asking us to build and design. So it was uh, a, a fun project and uh, 
<clears throat> but in the meantime, Nancy's parents retired from Venezuela and they moved to Forest Grove. And that gave us an opportunity to drive up for holidays and, uh, and visit uh, with the children and uh, they would have some exposure with their grandparents. And so we, we got some familiarity with, with Oregon. At some point, the two of you made a decision to leave these fun, relatively well-paying <laughs> adventures <laughs> and leave that behind and decide to, to go into winemaking. Was, was it really, was it more to move to Oregon or was it specifically to make wine that you came here? There's an interesting story as to how we decided to do that. I was out of a job. Uh, well, at that point, I mean, the story begins where I was out of a job. <clears throat> and um, the story is that we took a trip had no work, so we took a trip across the United States. We had two children at the time, and Nancy was pregnant. And so we left our car in New York and took a plane flight to Iceland to visit my brother. And um, he had gone to Iceland because he was an artist and in out of New York and wanted to go away from that environment and do his own thing. And uh, in the meantime, he was involved with some of the, I think some of the things that encouraged him was, again, he talked about gardening it's in, and uh, wanted to do gardening in Iceland. And it's very difficult, very difficult. However, <laughs> we arrived and uh, with two and a half children and we spent part of that summer with him. So, what's the other part of that story? Do you recall? Yeah, it's really miserable to go across country pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> with somebody who doesn't like to stop the car. <laughs> but um, while we were there, uh, his brother, his name is Frank, he... Um, uh, he had grown a crop of celery. I mean, he was doing cool climate and experiment. Well, he actually had grapes growing, but I, in a greenhouse. But um, uh, he had grown celery, and he had a huge crop, and uh, so he didn't know what to do with it all. And uh, he read a little book, and the little book told him how to make wine. And you can make wine out of anything, as you know. I mean, dandelions will be one of the many, many, many things. So he made celery wine. And he offered us some while we were there. And we th mm. OK, sure. It wasn't bad. It kind of tasted like white wine was supposed to taste. And we were very impressed. And then we had been experimenting with making some wine in California on a very small scale. And uh, he told Dick his secret was this little handbook of a guide to home winemaking, I think it's called. We still yep. have the copy. And it revealed the secrets of wine. It's called Don't Let It Get Oxidized. <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually an important lesson for home winemakers. Well, but well, most, most home winemakers don't get that part. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the wine was decent, but if you can imagine getting fresh fish that we did, and, and in mm -hmm. that environment, I think the wine had as much influence on us as the food. And so uh, that was a turning point. And uh, I remember the day exactly when we had this great meal, and I ended up, he showed me the book, uh, and it's a little pamphlet. And um, I read it that night, and the thing that hit me was, <clears throat> other than the dandelion, or the uh, celery wine, is that he created the wine from, from the recipe. The recipe being 
sugar, raisins, citric <laughs> additions, whatever you have to do to get the components of wine together. And the celery was obviously the bulk of it and water. So, but the food was very good and that was very impressive. <laughs> but the thing that hit my mind, because we never wanted to make homemade wine, was the addition of uh, metabisulfite. That was the key ingredients that my parents never understood. They wanted to make pure wine, and they didn't drink it fast enough before it turned to vinegar, of course. But <clears throat> that, that notation really hit me as being the, the secret ingredient. <laughs> what? What we call on all our wine bottles, sulfides. Yeah. <laughs> sulfides. It seems to me that was kind of an aha moment for you, that in a sense, you could make wine. Not that you were, I mean, were you thinking of changing professions at No, that point? no, that was, that was the, the thing that immediately came to our mind was, well, when we get back home, we're going to find some grapes and we'll make some wine and see how well it turns out. So up until that, you had not made any home oh, wine? Oh, no, wouldn't get near it. Yeah, no. got it, got it. Uh, okay. We, we could buy much better wines. Yeah. But then again, we had two children, and it was right about harvest time by the time we arrived in, back home. Uh, again, I kind of felt to my childhood days that Let's give it a try with the kids, the little kids, you know, two and four. They were, yeah, they were two and four. And uh, give them an experience. Well, we went out, we picked the grapes. We brought the grapes home. It was a great experience picking the grapes and bringing it home and crushing it and in the garage, as I remember very well, and uh, and the kids disappeared, and near Nancy and I were through the <laughs> night, squeezing and pressing and doing all we had to do, and uh, the kids could care less, of course. <laughs> but as it turned out, the wine was absolutely surprising, and that's what kind of what turned our mind to it. It's as uh, uh, this is fun. And we, we managed to pick the grapes from a novitiate winery, and uh, they just gave us free run, and we were able to run out there and pick what we wanted. So there's, there's an important transition going on here. Um, you, in essence, prior to Iceland, were happy never... <laughs> thinking about making wine again, having done it yeah. or seen it done and participating when you were a kid, suddenly you're back in on the peninsula, you're picking grapes, making wine, and this is, what, 66? No, 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 this no, was, uh, was six, uh, when Louisa was Louisa born, 665. 65, and uh, obviously we're coming into the Vietnam War period, we're coming into kind of getting, thinking that there is a different way for the world to be than what you grew up with? Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's what you're getting into, and that was very, very much a part of what we were thinking. Um, we, were, we were like, I think this is commonality with probably all of the people, the first people that were here, um, because as you've already pointed out, I'm sure uh, none of us were farmers. None of us knew anything about being farmers, but we decided we'd like to go live on a farm. So we brought all of our books on farming, and we moved on to farms. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, was, <laughs> it wasn't quite that easy. I mean, we, did, we had the Mother Earth catalog, of course, of course yeah. but uh, uh, there was the other ingredient, is that we made trips back up to Oregon and visited with her parents. And uh, mm -hmm. there was uh, a mention from her parents that there was somebody in Oregon making wines. 
and that happened to be Summers. So on our trips up, one of those trips, we stopped by and saw what he was doing. <laughs> and uh, for what we could tell, he was, he was making wines like we made back home. You know, whiskey barrels and whatever containers we could find. So uh, that is what triggered, basically, the idea, the combination of what you're saying, the unrest and the displeasures of what was happening and to get back to the land with our whole earth catalog and uh, some knowledge of winemaking, because I read the book. <laughs> and uh, uh, <laughs> it was just kind of a, a, a dream then that let's give it a try. And what that meant was to, to uh, once we understood once I had the, the book in my hand, I knew that that was the missing ingredient and therefore it was possible to make, to make wine if you had good fruit. And with that, you know, uh, we, we delved into it more. We drank wines. We could afford nice wines. We could afford Burgundy. And, uh, and then the idea, this is where Pinot Noir comes into it, is that California was making Pinot Noir, they said, and we were drinking Burgundy. And really, there's a, di a disconnect there in terms of the quality and the styles of the wines. So that uh, initiated doing more study and more uh, in-depth understanding. The, the next, on our next trip to, to Iceland, after Louisa was walking around, um, we, did, we dumped them in Iceland for a couple of weeks. Three little children, no yes. problem. Um, and we went to Europe, and that was very helpful. So we, we got to see some things there. And that was still before moving to Oregon. This was about 67, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, so that's got that's an important piece because that that makes that makes the connection between where grapes are grown more clear. I mean, up to that point, you were we wanted to get away from California. From <laughs> yeah, well, well uh, did you, you wanted to get away from California? You think? Yeah, we definitely yeah. wanted yeah. to get away yeah. from away California. from government job in California. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I did have a job then. I mean, I had the Disney work, right? <clears throat> and uh, but it gave us the ability to make a move and um, and to make these trips to Europe. Right. So we must have. I think it was two years there that we made. Trips. Yeah, just the celery green. wine and the burgundy. <laughs> yeah. Well, the celery wine, we don't only went as far as Iceland on that trip. <laughs> so I would make, since there was a guy in Roseburg making wines and had a vineyard. Well, that's, that's a big thing for Oregon. And, uh, and so that energized us a little more. And really made the, made the pitch to come north, but we also did trips in the States. I mean, we traveled to Mendocino, for example, even though it was California, and uh, that was nice. It looked cooler than, than Napa. And then we went to Okanagan, British Columbia, and looked at that, and uh, that's pretty far north, and for reasons of the of the lake and things, it was more moderate. But all of these areas were really kind of remote from any place else. It was a little more daring to say, well, we'll do it in British Columbia. <laughs> well, we knew nothing of British Columbia except that a possible grape area. And then Mendocino was still in California and Oregon was left, as far as we knew, other than Burgundy or Alsace. And so 
uh, the other call we got from your mother <laughs> that there was a house in the area and it happens to be a house that's no more than a half a mile away from here that was up for sale. And we were in California trying to find a way to make a move. And you were definitely thinking Oregon by then? Yes, because I made several flights up to Oregon looking for land uh, while I was working. Yeah. And, uh, and then we're leading up to, you know, we're kind of in, when we moved it was 69 and we bought the house uh, shortly before that. Uh, so we bought the house in the spring, summer. No. Sight unseen. No, it was just before Louisa's birthday. No, no, in Nancy, we bought the summer. house. Excuse we us while we California. have a little discussion here. <laughs> <laughs> we can edit that out. The, the important part was my mother called yeah. and she said, um, that her, this friend of hers had a rental house that they had sold, but the guy, she, they thought the guy was pulling out and would be, be interested. And so 10 minutes later, we called back and we said, we'll buy it. Well, wait a minute. We, we knew did some it was, research. We asked in what between? was the size of the house, <laughs> how many bedrooms, and what did it look like, and they're relatively new. <laughs> And you went online and researched. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, had, it had two bedrooms and a bathroom and a kitchen. That was about it. Yeah. So that sounded fine. <laughs> and, and I, from the flights up here and from coming up, we knew the general area. Yeah. But at least it would be a nest for us. Yeah. And that's, uh, so it gets you in the neighborhood. Pretty close, yeah. But you didn't have a job. You didn't have a job. Yeah, well, fortunately, Dick fell into a job very quickly. But I mean, we didn't have a job. No, there was no job waiting here, no. No, we just, you know, I, I think, again, the commonality with everybody here is you just figured something will turn up. It'll, I can do something. You know, Dick could go help people build something or whatever. I could teach something. Um, that was it. We didn't really worry about that too much. Yeah, that's uh, true. But as it turned out, again, it was near the holidays, and, and we were invited to a party uh, with neighbors over here. And the guy uh, taught math at Portland State, and he said, oh, you're an engineer? We really need an engineer. Somebody's just dropped dead or something, and, and we need an engineering teacher. There. At Portland State or Portland Community College? The community College. Yeah. Well, it was a little more dramatic than was that. Was it? Yeah. That was pretty dramatic. <laughs> we had no work. We were at a party. We were drinking. And he says, why don't you go down and check the engineering department? He had no idea that what the engineering department was. Oh, what? No. So I just stumbled into the office and said, uh, I'm looking for work. Do you have any needs for anything? And as my companion instructor told me that he got this call from the department head that there was a guy down in the lobby who was looking for an engineering job. And at the same time, this department head said, button him down because we just lost somebody who wasn't coming back for the second term. <laughs> so it, why did that happen? For what reason? I was there at the right time with the right needs. <laughs> you needed a job and they needed a job. Yeah, well, they were desperate. <laughs> so a week later, or the next weekend, I brushed up and went to school and did my first class. So that was... <laughs> with no yeah, teaching background at all. Came out of the sky. We were wealthy again. <laughs> but not very. Riding high. <laughs> so, so that was... Uh, that was you know, as I mentioned to you earlier, David, that there are certain things that come together, you know, and that was one time, one key time, the phone call from Nancy's parents saying that there was a guy in Roseburg doing something, the fact that there was a house in this area that we could buy, and that I had a job then suddenly. And so that was pretty amazing. Well, the next amazing thing was 
Want to tell about the book salesman? Well, it was not the book salesman at that time, but somebody oh. had. Uh, oh, the new the new newspaper article, the Forest Grove newspaper had a little article. You know, in the olden days, your mom would cut little things out of for the, the newspaper for you. And so my mom did that, and it was about somebody off in Forest Grove who was growing grapes. And it was Charles Quarry. So we immediately made contact with him. And You went up and... Well, we, we visited, but uh, knowing his personality, he was not very receptive <laughs> and was almost questioning me, what do you know about grapes? What do you know this? So, okay, uh, but, but then after that, I got a call from Dick Erath. And Dick Erath called here. He knew my number somehow. And uh, Nancy said that I was out chasing the fox, so I didn't have a chance to talk to him. <laughs> But that that was the time that Chuck and Dick were having this nursery, and they were anxious to sell grapes, cuttings, and things. So that that really brought us together with those two guys. And then, as a teacher at the school, uh, book salesman came around because he had heard that somebody at community college was going to plant grapes here. Well, that obviously got his signal, so, so I sat down and we talked about that. So that all happened and within a year person? or two. Who was, who was that person? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was Dave Lett. <laughs> so here I got in contact with these three guys who were pretty instrumental in, in getting together too. They knew each other because of the same reasons. And so it, uh, it was a very coincidental thing that happened that kind of made our efforts seem more reasonable. Had you planted some grapes by then? No, because the book salesman sold me some plants. <laughs> he sold me Pinot Blanc. <laughs> yes. Just, let's point to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, That's so uh, sad looking. <laughs> and we knew that Pinot Blanc, you know, was a grape grown in the cool climates of Alsace. And uh, so it, it followed through that, um, that, that we had support. We had support because shortly afterwards, as you know, uh, we would have regular meetings. We would, we would talk about it. And that was a major thing. If we were the Lone Rangers here, like Summers was for a long time, uh, I don't think it would have gone as far as it has. So it's a wonderful thing. We, we left out the piece where you started looking for a place where you could plant grapes. Yep. And you found this place. Well. I was teaching, and Nancy said, well, we found a place. Well, he was far. gone, I, and, and I had the, the kids, except Louisa, they, in, over at Montessori School. And uh, so I could go around and look at property. And I came down here, and it was really <laughs> awful. But it was for sale, and we could afford it. And at that time, you know, we have to go way back in time, we thought, like Napa, that it should be flatter and with good southern exposure. So that's what we got here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, we I, learned I, more in the meantime. Yeah, but. no, I mean, I, I, you've long since moved up on hillsides, but, <laughs> but it was that it was flat like in Napa. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is it was pretty close to a city. That's right. That was, you know. That we, was part of our, 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 you know, you make your little checkoff list. Yeah, we needed to be New York City. Not that Portland was that much of a city, but man, it was better than San Francisco. <laughs> I guess was well, farther. Well, at the time, <laughs> I thought it was. It was <laughs> it, yeah, it was more, more. Uh, 
livable than McMinnville. You know, that's way out there, way out there. Or even for so we didn't. We weren't quite as adventurous as so. <laughs> One of the things doing this series of interviews has really pulled into my mind is that all of us up here were interacting with each other in various ways, and we'll come to that. But what happened in Washington County, which is closer to Portland, was actually different than what happened in Yamhill County, which is a mountain away of sorts, and just just far enough away yeah. that I think the, the social interaction within the wine industry and between the wine industry and potentially customers was quite a bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you well know, David, uh, uh, when we had our first wines, uh, we had to go to the city to sell them. And that's where we met you, or may maybe before that, before that. But at least you were a, a buyer at the restaurant. Right. And uh, you were the first sale that we made, you know, got, made our first four barrels of Pinot, and <laughs> when it happened, we, we went in to get into town and give it to the single two restaurants, maybe, that would buy them. Yeah, I, I mean, in, in, um, in Maria's book, he, she recalls a couple of instances of <laughs> you putting wine oh. in the trunk and, and getting Well, she rejection. elaborated a little bit. Did she? Yeah. Wow. I can't believe <laughs> Actually, these Bill kids. McLaughlin was really nice to me. He was never rude to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was at L'Auberge. Yes. Yeah. The first restaurant I went to, of course. Yeah. So uh, you know, the as you know, the the climate for uh, wines, the customers. Where would you go to sell your wines? And we always thought the local market would be the ones. There were a few wine shops, uh, a couple restaurants, and uh, that's probably all that we would need. And and uh, maybe we didn't think too much of a tasting room, but we eventually got to that point and uh, but I, uh, uh, there was more to the group than I think uh, I'd like to think of um, the support initially was some kind of confirmation that we had some with the wineries that were around that we had common uh, understanding of the region and why this region compared to other regions. So that's a pretty magical thing that people who came from so many different walks of life hit upon this concept of cool climate viticulture, which, which uh, was the utmost important part of that period, the growing of the grape and why we selected this grape and uh, uh, why we as a group came together to grow that grape and other grapes of cool regions. And that, to me, that is an amazing thing because there weren't, there weren't smoke screens or smoke signals going up to the world that, you know, this is the area. We, we really came upon it from different walks of life, uh, different backgrounds, but with the same understanding of why we're here. And I mean, that's a really serious point because you came here without knowing Let, Corey, Erath, and arguably you're the fourth physically to have arrived, but you arrived independent of those others. Yeah. That's... And and how much of the, I mean, I look at Corey's, at least the reputed master's thesis or something where he had argued that Oregon or the Willamette Valley made sense for these Burgundian and Alsatian grape varieties, but you hadn't seen that. You were here I had independently. no idea. <laughs> no, it was just noticing, I guess. Well, 
Cool, there was a cool climate, didn't Well, our understanding initially was just the wine differences in California. Pinot the, Noir and the climate. Pinot, Pinot Noir from California. Why would they be so different? And then, you know, this is what draws people into, into wine drinking is the interest in the complexities of it and you, you begin to understand regions that are different and have distinctive differences. But those differences were dramatic because they were blending Zinfandel on their Pinot Noirs. They were doing things, everything they could do, uh, except putting the name on the bottle that it was Pinot Noir. So that, that uh, was an important thing. One of the things that seems to have happened is, and this was, there are a number of, of things one can point, can point to, but the men in the family seem to have been assigned the job of grape growing or winemaking, and the women's role was not as defined. It was, it was not the lead in the vineyard or winery, Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, Nancy, that you and other women in Washington County came up with a role. That uh, yeah, we did. And um, I, I mean, you know, again, you have to go back in time. This is... 70s. Yeah, yeah. This is yeah, 70s. You can't apply this was this was a time when I, I mean my daughters cannot believe it. When I wrote a check, I had to sign it Mrs. Richard Ponzi. I hadn't didn't even have a name, so it was a different time. Yeah. So, you know, we did what we could, and uh, so obviously all of us worked like crazy to make this thing happen. But then it got to this point of realizing, okay, well, this is fine. We've got some barrels and we've got some vineyards and we've got the this, but now we've got to make some money and uh, we have to sell this. So we did, we got together and tried to think how we could sell it. How we, we've got a whole city up here. They should come out and see what we're doing. So we started attracting them. I made friends with uh, people in the food department at, at the Oregonian, our long lost, sadly departed Oregonian. Well, almost departed. <laughs> uh, uh, and they were excited, something new to, to write about, so it was really easy. I mean, you could give them all kinds of stuff and they would write about us. And um, we also, well, so, you know, we, Maria tells about putting the, the pretend table up out in the garage and uh, a beautiful bouquet of flowers. You always have to have flowers and um, some clean glasses and smile a lot and people come and they have fun. So we this did that. This is just magical. It just happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think the uh, uh, what you're going into, I think the very... Uh, progressive thing, although it seemed obvious to us at the time, was how people want to come out. We find out they want to come out, but they don't know where to go. I mean, you're out in Forest Grove to get out, you know, to, out in these places around the strange. So we, we made a guidebook and distributed it every place we could think of that there would be people interested in wine. And um, I, th I think that kind of got the interest going further with people that there's why I mean when people first came in here I, I remember them saying oh, I didn't know anybody made wine here in Oregon <laughs> you may have heard that outside of Oregon too I heard that time. a lot there <laughs> <laughs> probably up to five years ago <laughs> what do you know um but, I, uh, but that was good, and then we, we went further, and we had, uh, when Charles Corey was still involved with it, I'm, I think he was the one who had this grandiose vision of what, what we could be, which we pretty much have become, of having these 
very fancy hot stats you put on your tuxedo and drink fine wine and champagnes. Um, and we, uh, you know, while we didn't allude to that, we did have events. We had dinners. Uh, some, I think of some of the dinners we have that were so simplistic, but people had fun, and they told their friends about it, and they got interested well, in them. Well, they were here. Yes, they came out to the country, because it wasn't that far. They could, they could get here. They could, they, could, they could get to Forest Grove or Gaston. Or it wasn't that far. I, I grew up from age 11 in Portland. Mm -hmm. And... I tried after we moved to Newburgh to remember if I'd ever been in Newburgh before we moved there. <laughs> That's right. And it's so close. It's 35 <laughs> minutes or 40 minutes. And uh, literally, l growing up in Portland, we either went on vacation someplace or we did things in Portland. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you go to Newburgh or yeah. to Forest Grove or? Well, well, you're talking like that's in the past. It really isn't in the past. You can you can talk to kids in the high school in Newburgh who've never been to downtown Portland. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so. yeah. But I've got to say, an awful lot of people in Portland think of Washington County and Yamhill County and probably even Polk County as their wine country. Mm. Yeah. They're quite possessive of it. Yeah. It's a place where they take their friends visiting from out of town to show them what Oregon is really about. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's, to me, this huge, this fundamental change in what Portland is from what Portland was. But certainly in your cookbook, you yep. really illustrated, but also talked about the role of feeding people of meals as part of what helped build the wine industry. Uh, that's, that's right. Um, <laughs> everywhere. Uh, when the, the idea behind the cookbook was rather than just recipes, it was sort of a history but also to try to make that relationship of how involved wines, wineries in, and in other regions as well are with food. The, they just always, they go together. They have to go together. And uh, as the person who wound up doing the food part, I thought about that a lot because I had no idea I would wind up making fancy dinners for 20 people. I would wind up serving people hors d'oeuvres or, you know, at various places all around the country. Uh, but it had to be there and somebody had to do it. So I think that was the other thing that the women had to say, okay, we can do that too. <laughs> so there's a whole array of roles that the women in Washington County ended up taking on that was less definitive across the mountain. Uh, and certainly not as glamorous. I, well, I was going to say of the men. Uh, yeah, I think so. We, we were a little bit more aggressive in that area. Mm -hmm. But then we extended to all of the events that we have jointly done. Right, that right. I'm I mean, another... Just, just to stay on some of your accomplishments, another major event, I mean, it, it was definitive for the wine industry is the Salute auction and Salute as a, as a whole offshoot and a, and a world. Can, can you introduce us to what Salute was in the beginning, what it is now, and talk a bit about your role? Sure. Um of course, salud means health in Spanish, or it is, as we just had it as a toast, it means to your health, like, you know, shalom or whatever you say. Um, let's see, without going into too much detail, uh, 
we had made friends with a couple doctors, local doctors, who had become fans of the wine. And with uh, a local, they were not at a Portland hospital, but at a Hillsborough hospital. And they thought it would be really fun, being a little community hospital, to get together with the local wine community and do something nice, you know, a, a charitable thing. And that was the beginning. Uh, so we, we came up with a plan, and uh, there were, it wasn't just me, there were some other wineries there. And, um, well, why would we do this? You know, we want to have money for crippled children or for cancer or what, what would we, what, what we want to benefit if we made some money at this thing? And uh, the idea was brought up that, look, we have people, we would not have any wines in these bottles if we didn't have workers out there taking care of the fields. And they don't have all the benefits, as they still don't have the benefits of uh, health care and so forth. So isn't it not only a nice thing to do, but it is almost an obligation for us to do something for them. And at that time, of course, we couldn't afford to buy insurance policies for people that only worked three months out of the year or something. And um, so working with the hospital that was very receptive, we devised a plan that we could provide health care. And through the years, it's become pretty comprehensive. In fact, today they're at our winery and people are getting, uh, anyone who wants to run out there can get a COVID test, along with a flu shot. And it's free. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing and it's, it, it's worked to the benefit. I mean, it initially was Hillsborough, Washington County, but immediately for the first auction, you looked beyond that. Well, yeah, because there weren't enough of us to make a volume to make it really an interesting event. But I do recall the first one was at Rex Hill when they were in that very difficult uh, room with all the little oh, caves yeah. in it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Steve Volstek, we were auctioning off a half barrel of wine, and he actually took a half barrel of wine there. <laughs> I mean, that's not easy. It's heavy. It's awkward. He took the whole half barrel. <laughs> but it was colorful. Yeah. And, and again, not all the wines at that time were anything that you'd want to pay $5,000 a case for. But people did buy them. And uh, so it's become extremely successful. Yeah, we were able to do a lot. The the other the other thing, Dick, that we were all engaged in is creating this this whatever it was that was going to be this industry. Some of it required things that I certainly would never have thought of. What were the things that were bigger than Ponzi Vineyards that you thought were important and that you devoted time to? Well, it was uh, <clears throat> a number of things to begin with, and that is uh, we were teaching ourselves the very basics, how to and where to put in vineyards, how to, how to establish the vineyard. You know, our, our personal experiences were book experiences, and, and I was so naive that I even thought I could learn how to plow a field or cultivate or what, so I would spend time at the library and learning how to drive a tractor for what kind of implement and what are the names of these implements and trying to get an understanding of how to manage that field. So it was uh, new. Uh, we weren't farmers. Some of us did a lot of home gardening, I think. <laughs> uh, there were, you know, uh, I have to give credit to the uh, Campbells. Campbells. Um, but 
we had to teach ourselves. We had to establish simple things as spacing and uh, irrigation and the whole gamut of things. And no one had 300 acres to plant, fortunately. You know, we had small parcels we could experiment. And uh, I marvel at, I've got secrets about this vineyard that nobody knows except the tractor driver. <laughs> We've had rows that look beautiful on the ends, but something happens as you drive <laughs> through the vineyard. The rows come closer, and then they go out. <laughs> so I vary. And you become very intimate with your vineyards because of what the hell you started in terms of how you planted. So you, we made a lot of mistakes. But again, we had the support of people who had other experiences in planting vineyards. <clears throat> now, I always thought I was the one trying to learn, but we, we did sit down, I remember as groups in terms of talking about spacing. It's not like California. It's not, you know, the open wide spacing. So those are little details that we shared. And uh, I always think of the 70s as a time for learning how to establish a vineyard. And then towards the end of the 70s, how to make wine. And we shared all of those experiences. And we had to share them because the university wasn't very helpful. Uh, they weren't into vinifera grapes. And this was a whole strange industry coming to market here that uh, we had to teach ourselves. And I remember, you know, having our meetings at the firehouse. I'm tired. Right? <laughs> and the firehouse was a meeting place where people came and brought knowledge. Uh, we were drinking California wines during our breaks, but we kept saying, well, one day we'll have enough Oregon wines where we could drink our own wines. And in the meantime, we were teaching each other the different techniques of... Uh, starting a vineyard. And then we got into the process of making wines. As more wineries were, were making wines, it was a lot of issues, as I remember. And uh, one issue was, how are we going to deal with this high acid wines? It was something that consumed us for years, even before we got the first crop. The things we went through without the help of the university. I mean, we taught ourselves and the literature brought information to us. And the, the horror of having all of this high acid wines, what the hell are we going to do with that? And you know, the problem, as I recall, wasn't there, really. Now, we had some clones that were high acid, but we knew that this grape, Chardonnay, did not look like Chardonnay grapes that I remember seeing in Burgundy, you know? So you begin to associate your experiences. But I remember lecture after lecture on how to treat the wine when you have high acid wines. Boy. And then it kind of went away. That wasn't a big problem. Then the problem was, how do you treat the wine when you've got low acid wine? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or how do you treat the wine? How do you treat the grape? And you went through this series of equipment and changing your process. And you start with buckets and you start with small fermenters and you start with little destemmers, and then you grew into bigger equipment and your process began to change and, and you learned from, from these processes, <laughs> the Zambelli period, 
Every time a salesman came by to sell us equipment, we'd always try to find ways of making it easier for us. And this piece of equipment was so beautiful. It was stainless steel. It wasn't the, the Italian, uh, um, what was the red, the... Uh, <laughs> Ferrari red? Yeah, the Ferrari red <laughs> piece of equipment. <clears throat> but this piece of equipment that Jeez. came in, well, I don't remember the year exactly, but it must have been the late 70s. It looked beautiful and it destroyed the industry almost. <laughs> because it did things that we weren't doing on small batches. It was pumping, it was crushing, it was macerating, macerating it, and, uh, and it was only when we came together and we talked about this machine, people started saying, well, I modified it, I did this, I took away that and took away that and added this. And we realized that Pinot was quite a different beast and that the treatment of it had to be dealt with very carefully. And that was a big, big moment in this industry. Now, some people never experienced that because they came afterwards. <laughs> yeah. But we when got those into machines it. machines were no longer available. <laughs> no, yeah. no. The whole theory was changing. And, and that brought us together to Steamboat, you know? And Steamboat, as you know, was a collection of winemakers dedicated to making great Pinot Noir. And we would discuss wines. We would spend a week uh, discussing each other's wines, particularly their, we were asked to bring our worst wines so that we could critique them. And that was a big turning point, I think, in the industry. Not only here, but in California. Well, we I would say people from around all, the world. Around the world came. And so it was a real a lesson to us, and it helped producing good Pinot Noir. So those are that's another incident where because we had a collection of people who were definitely interested and determined and to realize that there were other people in the world who loved the fruit, loved the wines, but tried to make it in their own areas. I remember in Germany, you know, people, because Burgundy was such an important area and uh, they were dealing with this very, very difficult grape, it didn't always turn out well in other areas. So anyway, Steamboat was a major turning point. It, it, uh, we were able to talk about our flaws, we would talk about our equipment, and um, it changed a lot of people's uh, approach to the wine making. So that was key. That, that was, I find that to be a real key moment. Thanks you know? to David, he has ca carried it through all these years. Oh, no, well, no, I mean, there was certainly a period where I was heavily involved, but no more involved than you guys. Well, yeah. but it was, everybody was contributing to that. Yeah. And they, we felt how important that was. A lot of my interactions with both of you were on the road doing sales trips. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Oh, there was selling it then after that. <laughs> yeah. We learned how to make the wine. That part. Yes, yes, that part. yes, exactly. I mean, first you have to learn how to plant a vineyard. <laughs> then you have to learn, oh my God, now we got to make wine? Yeah. Uh, but uh, then we now, got all this. Now we wine. have to learn how to, remember all the years we talked about how to stick the label on the bottle so it wouldn't fall off if it ever got on a shelf? <laughs> <laughs> that was a hurdle. <laughs> no, absolutely. But, I mean, early on, Nancy, we went to Houston and did, I think, a tasting in some some high-rise in, in, in Westheimer. Wait, wait, wait. And well, you remembered the name Sugarland. 
And then surely we, that we one? did a, I couldn't remember, the oh. three, there apparently oh, we did. three different uh, country Maybe. clubs in Sugarland. None of them called Sugarland, but, uh, <laughs> but at one of them we did, we did a dinner, and I think Lett was with us. Probably. Yeah, I think it was the three of us, and and you went yeah. on this trip, partly because your brother was living in I Houston. Could, yeah, I could get us a free place to stay. Yeah. That was. That was a my, big deal. my contribution. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, in those days. A lot of sales trips had to do with where could we get free places to stay and not have to spend all our money. Yeah, and some I didn't want to go on because the accommodations were really terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Usually free. Yeah, but they could be crowded too. <laughs> but it, at, the, at the country club, I believe there was a wine writer a, a woman in Houston who set up this dinner and put this together and introduced us. I mean, it, it, it seems like second nature now, but it, we must have somehow learned that you can do a wine dinner with two other wineries. Yeah. And that you would help somehow make that work. Yeah, and I think part of why it worked, not only did we have different representations, but we were nice to each other. We would say, oh my God, you have to taste this Adelsheim wine. This is really good. And it didn't cost us anything to do that because we knew if your wine got their attention, eventually they'd get around to us, they'd get around to the other people. So, so there was uh, truly that feeling of uh, not competing, but really working together to everybody's advantage. And it didn't hurt that we were actually friends beyond appearing and we, and we in had a, together. We had a fun time on those trips, the yeah. ones I went on. <laughs> well, I remember mostly embarrassing myself at your brother's uh, house, <laughs> having never done one of these before and drinking everything that was poured. Uh, First mistake. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And another one, Dick, that I remember once Steve Carey was brokering wines, we ended up doing a number of events that Steve would set up, where uh, two or three or four or five, whatever the right number of wineries was for that trip, would go on these, these trips around the country. And, and one was close to where you grew up, if I'm... <laughs> yeah, in Pennsylvania. In western right? Pennsylvania. But well, that same trip, yeah, that's right. That was... Uh, the American restaurant, wasn't the that? The Wooden Angel. Wasn't that it? Or was it the American restaurant? I think it's an American, because he had all American uh, yeah. wines. But, and I think it was in association with the, the, the uh, Pennsylvania liquor control people or something. But there was an occasion, and you were involved uh, we had this dinner with the reps representing the Pennsylvania liquor control people because you had to get your wines approved by these people. Still do. And here we were, a group of Oregon wineries. And uh, I remember we had to introduce them to what we were doing in Oregon. But for some reason, now you may have been drinking, David, I don't know. But this is you not did go good. you I did agree. stand up and said, you know, before we go on with our discussion, you were going to point out to them where Oregon was on the map. And there happened to be a map up there. And you stood up there like a, a scholar explaining to them where Washington was and where California was and that little rectangle was Oregon. <laughs> and then that set it off where they had some intelligence as to where we were coming from. <laughs> Another time I remember taking a cab uh, to New, uh, to New York City and uh, with the cab driver uh, said, you know, we've got a little conversation going and I said, um, he asked me where I was from. I said, we're from Oregon. 
Oregon, he says. So he calls his dispatcher up and says, you know, I got a guy here from Oregon. Do you know where that is? (laughs) (laughs) And that's when we were trying to market New York. Because, you know, if you make it in New York, you make it everywhere. I think we're still trying. To get oh yeah. We still. I don't know. It's hard to keep it going. That's for sure. There were a lot of those trips. Yeah, as groups and as we bonded together, we had to bond together and and uh, surprised a lot of people that we were so friendly to each other. And uh, I remember that. I mean, there there was that okay. mammoth vertical tasting that Lila Galt yeah. helped us organize at uh, Lydia's. Right. Restaurant, right? And you and David Lepp and I basically went to Lila and her husband's house yep. in Connecticut. That's right. And we, we, we have to do all the, the handouts. Yes. And it was a 10 year vertical from three wineries, 30 wines. Yes. <clears throat> and it was, it was just nuts. So I think it was 79 to 88 is. Yes, the period was a that I remember. Oh, wow. Right. And, and the reason we did that is because every time we went to New York, as I recall, they would say, the retailers and the distributors, well, these taste kind of fruity and nice, but, you know, they're not going to last, right? So we had to demonstrate that at least we had 10 years under our belt. Right. And, uh, and yep, we had no- notes and we described the wines and. I think it was a good impression, but it was just another way of getting attention. You know, we had to do it constantly. International Wine Center. Yeah, the 85 tasting of... Yeah. Yeah. But to go there, I think we did it for two or three years. We'd go there as a group and, and do the morning critics tasting, the afternoon distributors, and then the public. Big free for alls, <laughs> free wine. <laughs> Every year, same thing. Yeah, it was tough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There is a very unique part to the Ponzi Vineyard story that, as far as I know, nobody else has done. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Which Can't <was> wait. <laughs> Bridgeport Brewery. Oh, to make beer. Oh, that part. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that isn't exactly true because Charles Corey tried to make beer, yeah. and that was our inspiration. And and when he screwed it up, Dick was he could see all the things wrong in the process, and he just had to do it <laughs> to show you could make a craft beer on a you know, larger scale. And that was his fun, and my fun was, I was really tired of telling people, but people, you know, people won't mind paying $6 for a glass of Chardonnay, and realizing that, no, but they might pay $5 for a big glass of beer. So, that was kind of my motivation. <laughs> I never liked beer, actually. <laughs> I never drank no, you our did. beer. We had to have wine at this. Group. We always had Pinot Noir available at the pub. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a, that was a, an interesting introduction for me uh, because California, there was a, a well-known craft brewery in California and uh, the beers were just beautiful and uh, the introduction was Corey to some extent but more uh, McMiniman really Mike and I were going to do it together until he had a problem with his distributorship so it it was still a a good idea in my mind and um, but I think I was probably intrigued more with the process. Uh, first, at first, at least, I knew you could make great craft wines, but the process was intriguing. It was a little bit of uh, a winery uh, in terms of its equipment, except the brew house was a real challenge for a small brewery. You couldn't go out and buy one. You had to build it and design it. 
and uh, and we did, and it was it was the most one of the most gratifying parts of business ventures that we did, in that it really spurred on a lot of other people to come into the market, and uh, and the beers were good, but it was so successful that it was more than we could handle, you know, in terms of. It was a different way of marketing beers. We tried to market the beers as very special, upscale clienteles. But every time we went to distributors, they always wanted to know, what are your point of sales? Do you have any t-shirts? Do you have caps? Do you have towels? <laughs> and we had these beautiful original artwork and everything, but it was over the heads. So that part didn't work out to us, and we then you had to uh, have a whole another distribution network that was so different. The volume, the was... volumes, and uh, salespeople out in the market. So it was, that was uh, so successful that uh, we just couldn't handle we gave those it products. Up. Gave it up. <laughs> well, you didn't exactly give it up. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, we required a little. <laughs> you you uh, successfully sold the company, I yes, believe. Would we be did. The... We did. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, again, that's a, a fortunate thing because uh, we ran across the right person interested in the right product. And... Um, <clears throat> <laughs> if I could tell, the, uh, we we were offering it on the, you know, dealing with the acquisition part of the bank, and and we ha we had some really interesting people come in. I mean, some <laughs> what was it? Torres from Spain came in, and all of these fancy Firestone came in. <laughs> that was a trip, and uh, you know, the, the, we had a lot of interest, but. Nothing was really, really happening. And, and in the meantime, this Mexican fellow from, from San Antonio came by, and he chat with Dick, and he was interested. And, and but, you know. We were well, too busy to yeah, talk we, to him. Yeah, well, you weren't too busy to talk to him. Well, the we rest of us were him, too yeah. busy to talk to him. You talked to him, you liked him. And he turned out to be the East Coast distributor for Corona Beer. And he already owned two or three other breweries in Texas. He had one, yeah. Well, then he bought that other one. Anyway, uh, and he bought it. And he ran it for 20, 30 years? 20 years, I 30 guess. 30 years. Yeah. Well, guess he ran it. Uh, 20 years, anyhow. 20 years more, yeah. And um, so... It, so it, so it, it went on, and, and I think a lot of people enjoyed the beer, the style of beer. They loved the, the pub. Uh, that pub was terrific. Uh, well, and and we were very that, sad. Did you have to pass legislation, even? Yes. Oh, that was, yeah, that's something, you know, David, that. Um, yeah, thanks for remembering that. was a real turning point for the craft breweries because. Uh, you couldn't sell your own product. Nobody had wanted to. Yeah. Up until then. You, yeah, and so to to model the craft breweries like a winery was the key issue. If wineries could have tasting rooms, why can't a brewery have a tasting room or a pub? We'll call it a pub instead of a tasting room. And so that's. The legislation was welcomed at, the, at uh, Salem, and uh, bingo. Man, when that happened, there were breweries on every corner, practically. And I don't know that it was the first state, but it was certainly among the first states to sort of welcome craft brewing. Yeah. 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 It set the tone. Um, and then we further, we continued this idea of Hey, the more the merrier, we're all in this together. And as, uh, as other people got, Widmer, of course, got started, Portland Brewing started, Deschutes, all these, you know, the, the ones that became bigger. Um, 
and uh, we worked together to market and did various events in the same in the same kind of tone as as the wine business that uh, okay oh, we're going to do this so yeah. the in the most successful thing and the most ambitious thing that that it even frightens me now to think that we did this was the Oregon Brewers Festival right. and we Which overlapped in time with IPNC if I'm not Yes that mistaken. was yeah. when I uh, when I I was given the choice of working at IPNC or going to Brewers Festival, and I'm sorry, but uh, you know the glitter. <laughs> so I did miss a year, uh, but um, you know it, it's grown into a four-day event well, now yeah, or something. It's, it's, it's crazy with thousands and thousands of people. The first the first year we were expecting maybe five thousand and got. 50,000, I think. It was just insane. Well, going back to the People organization, it. It, was, it was similar to IPNC in that oh, absolutely. we invited people to come to, the, to our town, basically. So we invited breweries across the country to come to Portland. And, uh, and we even paid for their beer. Yeah, we didn't ask thought, them for donation. No donations. We'd buy their beer and show their beers. Well, they were just so happy about that. And uh, so, it, again, it developed that whole culture for, for the uh, microbreweries. How did Bridgeport contribute to Ponzi Vineyards? I mean, there was some money, obviously, but were there other aspects of it that... Well, sure. We have a bunch of grandchildren that have got to go to school. <laughs> that was a, I guess that was a contribution to the goodwill of the world. <laughs> that's that's got to be pretty great. It was. And the other thing, as far as the the um, the wine, what did what did it contribute to wine? Um, and, and I know it sounds like a made-up story, but it's really not made up. We, um, um, Marie and I in particular, uh, really wanted to do something down on the other side of the hill, and not particularly to promote Ponzi. Of course, we're promoting Ponzi, but their tourist facilities were almost non-existent. In Yamhill in, County. In Yamhill yeah. County. Yeah. I mean, what, there was Nick's. They were open from time at night. Uh, and fast food restaurants, there wasn't much at all. And so um, we thought it would be very nice for visitors who get in that part of Oregon to have a wine shop that would showcase all of our wines, which we did, and um, to have a restaurant that was open every day for lunch and dinner, so tourists and locals would have a nice place that they could come to and eat. And um, it's amazing, you know, it's over 20 years old now. The, it the is restaurant. called? It is called Just the Dundee Bistro. I'll have to it's, add a little part to that. Oh. We didn't want the restaurant. Yeah. Well, we didn't really. We didn't want to run a restaurant. <laughs> no, that, no, no we were smarter yeah. than that. But we <laughs> succumbed, and um, I never want to run another restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so you bumped it off on yourself. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. And he's doing very well. He's doing a great job of it. <laughs> well, it's uh, it's it's. Yeah, and, and it was uh, another one of those things. We took a little uh, risk, and, um, and people appreciated it in the area. It was, it was very nice. It was, again, we wanted to get exposure. We were on this side of the hill. More wineries are becoming more popular on that side, so we, we thought well, well, uh, we exposure with there. a tasting room and wine bar. And it's worked pretty well. We don't have a wine bar there now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't know whether it's selling spaghetti, you know. <laughs> That's all right. So, Things have changed a lot there. So when you started, you have said that Napa was planted on the valley floor. Made perfect sense to do that here. 
What was the evolution from here to most of your vineyards being on the hillside and ultimately building a winery uh, up where more of your vineyards are? What, what was the evolution in your minds? Well, we wanted, we learned. Uh, we wanted to uh, expand the winery. And um, so the facility here was pretty restricted. Boy, I mean, if I went through the process here and what we had to do to make wines in the cramped quarters, we never, uh, this all started with an incremental space that grew and each year it would change and it would grow and grow, but never grow far enough. And uh, I remember one year when we had a case, an, a load of bottles in case goods sitting outside to be used for that next harvest and get soaked with water and just terrible. So it was never, whatever expansion we did here was not enough. But, uh, so we wanted more land and uh, the timing of where to go and um, uh, how to go, how to buy the land. And land was pretty reasonable then uh, as opposed to the last four or five years here. Um, there was a piece of land that was offered to us where the existing new winery is and I looked at it, uh, it was 40 some acres, and um, I decided it was strong exposure, not high enough, and just forgot about it. And probably looked at other lands and uh, we kept wondering whether we should be on the other side of the hill or this side of the hill. Anyway, uh, it was decided that uh, particularly with the young kids coming on to the winery, they were pretty pushy in terms of, I mean, Maria had offices upstairs here and we had the winery spread out and the cellar was partly in the house. It was all disorganized. So we dreamt of, you know, doing a, a full scale winery, properly designed and uh, so we went back and looked at that, hot, that piece of property. It was neighboring people who wanted to retire. Well, the property was sold. And so our son, Mikhail, took it upon himself to approach the new buyers. And the new owners, they, yeah. Yeah, who, and wanted to see if they were interested in selling. And uh, they bought it and had it for two years and didn't do anything and dreamt of doing a, a house on the property. It was all in filberts and walnuts. And so they were ready to get rid of it. And so we bought it and it was close to our, our larger vineyards. And so that was a big turning point. It uh, put us in debt. <laughs> that was a big turning point. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we did our own uh, design and, and uh, clearing of the land and worked at it and uh, finally decided on the building and, and went to it. So that was a big change. And then Maria had her offices down here and we then had the processing up there and then the big push then was to move everybody up at the new place. So we went to the bank again and uh, had a wonderful architect in-house. <laughs> and uh, he designed the tasting room and office. Maria's husband. Yeah, <laughs> Maria's husband. And did a beautiful job with that. We managed to do it, but it really put a lot of pressure on us, no question, just to be able to finance that. Again, it was fortunate the land value was not as where it is today. And um, we did as much as we could alone. And uh, that was a big turning point and that was really uh, a fortunate thing that we were able to swing it because we started that project in 08. <laughs> Remember 08? 
Yes, I no, was financially <laughs> awake. Yes, so what happened yeah. the next year? Yes. Well, fortunately, the bankers stayed with us, but it frightened the hell out of us in terms of the obligations. As yeah. it turned out, it's, it was very successful. And I remember an expression that, you know, in the meantime, Louisa was back here making the wines and um, Maria was in her office. Everybody was doing fine. And at the first harvest in 08, Louisa said, boy, it's sure easy to make wines here. <laughs> you don't have to deal with these I never knew dominoes, it was so easy to make wine. <laughs> moving things around. So that was worthwhile. That's what kept her at home, I guess. She was happy with that. Well, and I wanted to ask, because um, only half of the first 10 wineries made it into the second generation. Yeah. And, well, the other thing is that very few of us are still married to the people that we were married yeah, to that, at the beginning. I, I, I'm going to talk to Fuller about that because he 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 brought that up and mm. and uh, yeah, it's really only you and the Campbells, the Quarries and the Letts remain married too. So yeah. Let's, yeah. let's say sixty percent. That's but, a um, problem. Yeah, but I, I'm thinking mostly about the second generation now. Did you, as you look back, did you, were you hoping that they would have an interest on the one hand? And there was, was there anything you did? Well, you know, somewhere along the route here, somebody told me that there is an old German proverb that German? said a German, well, not a proverb, a curse. Oh, a and curse. it says, may you inherit a vineyard. <laughs> and I understand that. <laughs> so no, we did not expect them to come in. We, they, they all had their own talents, which... It wasn't planned. And, and I, that's another point. And I keep reflecting on, you know, the, all these little points that we're bringing out in our discussions and from how to make the wines and how to plant the grapes and on and on, uh, yeah, we were getting a little bit tired, but we were still pretty much involved when the kids went off to school, one at a time, and uh, we never thought we'd get Louisa finished from school, but... Uh, <laughs> the youngest. <laughs> and, and, you know, Mikhail, our son, wanted to be a musician and spent some time in California where he was cautioned by one of his instructors to, if you have a family business, I would suggest you go back to your family position. Not that he wasn't a good musician, it just was not going to be an easy one. Yeah, he so went a life he, of touring and not yeah. having a home. So mm -hmm. when he graduated, he, he had his high set on the winery. He wanted to be involved in the business without any other alternative in his mind. He had, he felt that probably, he probably felt that he could still do his music and work within the winery. And I guess we could afford him. I wasn't sure how that even worked out financially from our standpoint. But he was around during the, uh, the sale of the the brewery. Oh, the brewery. brewery. Yeah. yeah, he was very helpful. Yeah, so he was working mm -hmm. mixed in the brewery and the winery, so that was handled all right. And then, when Maria graduated a year later, she uh, was in marketing as a journalist major, and uh, and went away to Connecticut, Boston, and. Um, and uh, we thought, well, we're going to have to bring her back somehow. But it didn't look like it was going to happen. And so uh, then Louisa was still trying to get through college. And Maria says, why don't you join me on a world trip? Maria was going to quit her job and take a trip around the world. You can get these passes, you know, you can do a world trip. You can get on the plane, get off the plane. So she invited Louisa to come along with her. And so they traveled 
for eight or nine months, and uh, a lot of things happened on the way between the two of them. Uh, Louisa never did things the way Maria would do things, but they got to realize they had to work together, and they knew each other's faults, I think. Huh? That's what they say. They, they're still learning their faults now, I must have to say. <laughs> but uh, so they traveled and traveled and uh, had accidents and situations and met people and but they romances romances and they ended up coming back by way of Europe and I think uh, they traveled through the wine region and got some uh, flavor of that region and on and then and then they came back and Maria said that she'd like to work at the winery so just out of the blue or well, as she, a result of the conversations probably because yeah the conversations and she was tired of the east coast and uh, so great you take your mother's obligations and help with that part of it so, um, and then Louisa had to go back to school and she had to decide uh, how she was going to graduate and uh, she finally graduated uh, with a degree in, if you could get this, liberal, a uh, liberal arts sci uh, bachelor's degree. A bachelor's, bachelor's degree in science. science with a major in liberal arts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that sounds pretty inclusive. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how Portland she State. managed to get all her all her credits together, I think. And so she had some science credits that she could use. And then she uh, heard about the school in France that she could go to France and spend a year there. She didn't know French, so she went off in the uh, in the spring and tried to get as much French under her belt, and then she went to the school. But, but was this out of the blue? I mean, was this, well, was, did she and Maria have a conversation on this eight months? You that, know, whether I, it was I, a yeah, good yeah. idea to come back to the family well, as a- Well, that and <laughs> that, that Maria was gonna do the marketing and Louisa was gonna do the winemaking, I mean. No, uh, uh, I don't know what they discussed exactly, it but it, it happened after she, okay, so they arrived do back- Do I have to interview them too? <laughs> no. Well, well, one of Maria's basis for her decision that she said is she'd been working and, and doing quite well financially, but she decided if she was gonna work that hard, why not work for yourself? Why is she working for some guy sitting up there in the office upstairs? So that was her motivation and uh, continues to be, I think. Yeah, and I think Louisa's part, probably, I think, I think the exposure to Europe in Burgundy, particularly in, in the wine regions, because they spent quite a bit of time there. Uh, and uh, she had to finish school, and I think during that time when she was finishing school, she worked at the winery and, uh, and then decided there was this opportunity to go on to further her education and, and she found the school in Bone and went off to them. You know, it was, it was no, there were no, until the moment of having an interest that I give any support to it. But maybe there was because there wasn't any alternative in their lives. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe they, they, they understood this life a little bit. But from Maria's book, I don't think she understood this life much. <laughs> it was not a very pleasant job to be involved with. So anyway. But I would like to just add to that that uh, in this bigger picture because of our associations, which you have been very, very involved with, with um, IPNC and, and all the interrelationships and friendships that have been made with, with the European wine regions, that it was really, uh, Veronique was, uh, Duran was very helpful. And, uh, so she knew, uh, the, I can't remember the initials of the place. I Lichet, can't either, it's the Lycée yeah. 14 <laughs> French word. Lycée, yeah. yeah. So uh, she, 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 she went there. Out to Louisa. Yes, yeah. 
and you know where to write the letters, how to how to do this. And she was she was, again, you know, just because we're colleagues. That was yeah. she had nothing, no alternative. It was just because. So that was that was very nice. And plus, uh, you know, she she lived in the house of uh, Christophe with the Romiers, and the, so those relationships have made a big difference for all of our kids. Yeah. Well, before we go on to finish that story of the Druins, I think we need a little more wine. Okay. Thank you. It's a good idea. Yes. Always advocate Pinot Noir for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> What, what I was thinking about, about Robert and, and, and Veronique, too, is that they were so amazed that we would welcome them, not think of them as <laughs> yeah. outsiders and, and, and absconders with our heritage, but yeah. what, that we wanted them to come. And, and I, think, I think they treasure it to this day. Mm -hmm. Apparently, uh, Robert was picked up at the airport one time by David Millman, the general manager, and the, he had just been hired. And Robert's almost first words to Millman were, we want you to ensure that our relationship with the community is healthy, mm. that it is well cared for, <laughs> and that we are doing everything that we can to help the community. And that's got to be such a different role for them than what would go on in Burgundy, where it was, uh, uh, Robert told me a story once of what it was like to be waiting for a train at the train station in Bone, and Louis Latour came along, and they'd have all sorts of conversations about well, how are the kids? Mm -hmm. And about anything except business. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, I think uh, we brought something to them, uh, particularly with the young winemakers, oh, yeah. and you know that. Uh, the, they found such uh, uh, liberation. They were coming into their wineries as young people, and when they came here and met us, they felt, I'm, I'm sure, a kinship that they could be honest with, they could t speak freely, and they probably took some of that back with them. Because it's true, they, I don't think they tasted much together, you know, to no, exchange. No, I remember we were, um, after IPNC was going, and a number of people have been here, uh, we were in Burgundy at the, uh, with the Favleys, and they had a, a, you know, tasting of new wines. <laughs> and they admitted they had never done anything like that before. They invited all their neighbors in to bring the wines in, talked about them, and it was, yeah. a, it was very congenial. And, and they said, you know, they saw that we could do this. But they and, came, and they they, we were guests, but they brought all of their friends to do the tasting with us yeah. in a very with us. friendly way. Yeah, and that's not something that they would naturally do. That's no. For sure. no. No. So I think we... Uh, and know. at last to this day, I, I don't know when you were last in Burgundy, but we were there two years ago, somewhere before last. It's amazing. The, yeah, the doors are the, still open. Yeah. Oh, if, if anything, all the more so. I mean, yeah. when we were there last year, we were we were equals in the, yeah. to them, uh, and it's sort of amazing. It's to sort me. of yeah. startling, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, they, they, wow. they're being nice to us. <laughs> they're still nice. To they're us. still nice to us. <laughs> I don't know why? <laughs> I wanted to turn to uh, the main Druan because you had a lot of relations with the Druans like we did, and, um, and, and I, wanna, I wanna focus on that for a second. One of the interesting quotes I came across <clears throat> that, that has been referenced a couple of places is from John Hager in his uh, North American Pinot Noir book 
in which he said, it can be argued that Ponzi more than any other is responsible for the combination of generosity and high-toned elegance that typifies the majority of Oregon Pinots today. And on the one hand, you could say, well, that's the Ponzi's doing marketing, but... We, we did a good job, obviously. But, yeah. but, but I also remember at that, at that vertical tasting at Lydia's, yeah. thinking, my God, Dick, you're 85. <laughs> It was so perfect. Yeah, that was. That was a perfect wine, no question. It I agree. It was so incredible. And at the, at, um, I mean, before that, you were really going every which way trying to find a direction. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that that's happened since from time to time. But what I wanted, I, I kind of agree with that statement in a sense, that that the the style that Oregon is now really quite famous for, as, as John said, the combination of generosity and he said high tone, I don't know about high tone, but <laughs> generosity and elegance, I certainly agree with. Do you remember being on a quest for a style of Pinot? Well, one thing for sure, uh, we, and I, I think it's because we drank a lot of Burgundies in California, but I probably forgot about it. I don't know. But I think it's, we didn't, we, we saw like Zinfandel in California that went crazy with extractions and, and never could, you couldn't deal with it if you're going to eat a meal. It would dominate a meal. So I think that was one thing that I didn't want to do, although... You know, we struggled a long time for color and felt kind of a little uh, embarrassed when we were in New York peddling our wines and people would say, well, this is hardly a red wine. And then you have to give an alibi like <laughs> Lett would always do. Well, it's missing one gene. <laughs> and therefore, Pinot is lighter. But we always still wanted to have some color. And, um, well, I'll tell you this, and you probably did the same thing. I, I was doing a lot of things differently and tried to learn from the beginning. I mean, this was the whole thing. Uh, the equipment that we use, because I, my background is engineering, uh, I even made a destemmer myself and used it and was incorporating things that I found out you shouldn't do. And so I think because all of us started with small fermenters and every time you made an improvement, you wanted to see whether you were doing anything differently, learning anything, and whether you were going in the wrong direction. And Zambelli was a big lesson. That was a big lesson. and. So how to treat the fruit, and, and, um, and uh, be as gentle and as, as um, uh, less extraction and everything. Uh, so whatever appeared to be more reminiscent in my mind, in my memory of what I liked in drinking uh, great wines, I guess I was trying to emulate that without overpowering it although you're tempted to and the 85 was was a, 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 a change in my style I think because it was such a satisfying wine in that it was everything it had all those components that you think about when you're making wines and you it, it just fit together and uh, <laughs> I went to the point of looking in the cellar where that 85 was, what barrels did I use? What was so different about those barrels? And it wasn't any individual barrel. It was that collection that we, we always separated all the vineyards in the, in the barrel room. But anyway, uh, it, was the, it was a time, it was a lesson for me as to what to strive for because it was so well composed and 
complete. Yeah. So, but, so you are having a a style conversation of sorts with yourself. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and then when Louisa came on in '93, uh, as a young winemaker, she she wasn't quite confident enough at that point to do anything differently. And and uh, and even afterwards, she mentioned that and. Um, but she had to go through a lot of the processes that I did in terms of the barrels, in terms of the uh, temperatures and things like this, and uh, uh, cold soaks and all that kind of stuff. And she had to learn her way and uh, to come upon a style that suited her. So that she had all the freedom in the world to do whatever she wanted. And that was that was good. That was pretty liberating, I think, for her. Even though I just made a comment to her the other day. <laughs> I was going to say, isn't, isn't there sort of a backstop there? Of some yeah, kind? there's there's some things. Well, uh, her first exp I shouldn't even tell you. I don't. But. <laughs> <laughs> You're stuck. Yeah. The cameras are rolling. That's yeah. all right. It's, it's, it's only on film, dear. That's all right. <laughs> well, she was filling up barrels, for example, of wine, new wines, and the damn barrel would not fill up, and she realized that she, the barrels weren't soaked, you know? <laughs> and so, but that's, you know, that's just a little experience of... You assume that the damn barrel is going to hold wine. Yeah, those kinds of things. So Somebody was else was supposed to do it, and <laughs> elsewhere it was running out. Yeah. yeah. So those are little practical things that you learn. But I think she's she's got a great palate because she was in Burgundy, and she was drinking some of the best Burgundies. For available, a year, you know, and that was good palate training, I think, for her. So, I, I'm really, uh, I really, and she loved what she was doing. So that was good, and that she was rewarded for those things. And whether it's my style, no, because in my style, I had certain size fermenters, and the fermenters were. For some reason, well, because of their sizes, the fermentation went through just beautifully <clears throat> without controls. Now she's making bigger fermenters, and she's having to deal with uh, fermentation profiles and being very distinct. And and uh, and I bought onto that, and I thought, well, I guess you'd have to do that with these large fermenters, not. You know, three-ton fermenters, not very large. So uh, she's got more tools, and I think, I think I, I'm pleased with her style, too. Well, she's been pretty consistent yeah. with delicious wines, so we'll keep her on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had, an, I had another way of asking about your kids. So... In the 60s, there was this couple living on the peninsula that was starting to reject the, the world that had been given to them in the, in the 50s, maybe the early 60s. <clears throat> and this, this couple decided to get back to the land and to do things for themselves. I know a little bit about what, what that couple might have been like. Um, and, and this couple was you, and, and you, you gardened, you had animals, you cooked as much as you could, you preserved things, you wanted to make your own wine, uh, you created a community uh, in your own image around you. Uh, to not only help with the wine, but to create a life for yourselves. You have three kids. Which of the ideals, of, of your ideals from the 60s, are being 
represented by them today? <laughs> well, for better or for worse, probably with Louisa, because she keeps all these silly animals all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Does she have, what is it, Scottish long hair? Yeah. yeah. Well, the first woods lived right around the corner there. Yeah. Uh, I remember that. Yeah, so that's sort of a, a family tradition to have Scottish Highlanders. Um, no, and, and she makes cooking very complicated. Uh, always doing, if you can do it harder, do it that way. I remember you guys cooking sweetbreads. Yeah. That was sure, the most yeah. ridiculous thing to take on. <laughs> that was for Reaper That was yeah. for uh, I love that. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty crazy. Um, but uh, they all are pretty charitable, and they were proud and, you know, take good care of their families. And Well, I think home. they... Um, you know, I, uh, Maria's book talks about all the hardships that she remembers. And I don't remember hardships. I know that I was in the winery with spraying down the floors that froze as fast as I sprayed the water. <laughs> and I know that, you know, we were preoccupied with wines and winemaking and wine people. But I, uh, because... We, in, we, had a, we had an enjoyment for doing what we were doing. So I think they have that feeling. I think they understand that you want to do things that you can really enjoy. And we tried to instill that, I think. We didn't push anything that I'm aware of pushed anything onto them. I, I sometimes worry that we push too much in terms of giving them the responsibilities and the, and the, uh, the trauma with that. But they come back. They're very resilient in that way. They seem to enjoy their work. Uh, Mikkel, when he left the winery, he basically did it because he wanted to do something else. And that, you know, I couldn't fault him for that. <clears throat> but uh, uh, the kids were kind of disappointed. They were the three musketeers, you know. They, had, they, they worked with each other. They fed each other ideas back and forth. They didn't sometimes always agree. But I think he was strong enough and wanted to do something else, basically. And uh, so that's, that was fine. And the girls have carried on so brilliantly. And they're always so uh, kind to us. And they do, they, they are concerned about the world. You know, they're concerned about poverty. They're concerned about all the problems of the world, which to me is wonderful. And the environment. They, and the environment. They've, they've taken that one on, which we, as you guys, have been yeah. very involved with all your lives. Sure. So. Even, even Maria, you know, she criticizes how terrible it was as a childhood. But <laughs> I think those remembrances give her a lot of strength and understanding of how other people live. Well, and also her editor told her if she didn't have a little bit more of it, challenge to overcome in her life, it wouldn't be interesting. So I think she emphasized some of those things. But. Well, and a book isn't a thing that is impassive. The reader brings something to the book yeah. as well. Yeah. And I'm going to accuse you of looking for all the negatives. <laughs> because when I read it... <laughs> it didn't come out quite, quite so. Oh, my gosh. I, I noticed that from time to time she would, she would mention those, but I thought it was an extremely <laughs> loving book, in fact. And yeah. that it was, Overall, yeah. yes. Um, and it's a loving thing to the industry. You know, she's worked on that for 20 years. Yeah. And all the other stuff that but happens. But it isn't the book that we thought she was going to write. We well, it didn't, it didn't, uh, history. Some of this stuff, the history. 
But, but she did interview quite a few people. That's what I and heard. She, and yeah. she's brought in a lot of it and tried to be very accurate yeah. in the history that she brings in. So, yeah. yes, it's a bit of a, a, a love letter to the industry, too. What is it now? 50 years, right? Yeah. This well, year? we missed our 50th anniversary, <laughs> so we're just going to come to yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not all together sure that ours will be a face-to-face -to -face yeah. event. <laughs> but with 50 years of perspective, would you do it again? Was it worthwhile? Did you oh, create that's something a, that's a, of value? Well, obviously we created something. I think we created two big things which have been a, a great benefit to the state of Oregon. So uh, not that we single-handedly did that, but we were part of it. So I'm very proud of that. <laughs> well, we didn't know what we were creating, really. I don't think. I mean... Corey may have had a vision. We all talked about a vision, an industry. Uh, Dave Lett probably talked about it. But, uh, I mean, why? I don't think you could map it out. Well, we never had a business plan. Nobody that I know of had a business plan. Where were you going to sell your wines? Well, Portland is right down the road. We're going to sell all of our wines in Portland. And then you realize, wait a minute, no. And now it's, then you go out and hit the world and they've slammed a the door on you. And uh, so you do it again and you try again. How many distributors have we had? My gosh, people who, who welcomed us in. I think about Boston, you know? What about those days in Boston? They took care of us. They, where, where we... <laughs> we were all with one distributor yeah. who lived uh, in Medford, actually Winchester, on a hill that apparently was where Tom McCall That's right. was this, born. This yes. Is, yes, that was ironic. And, and Sam Seidman was this distributor who claimed that he had missed the great California wines, but he wasn't going to miss Oregon. And so <laughs> yep. he had you and, and us. Didn't. And he yep. Uh, who knows how many Oregon yeah. wines. So those trips, you know, the lobster meals were wonderful. <laughs> that big house was unbelievable. <laughs> and he believed yeah. in us, you know. And we drank a lot of <laughs> Latour. White, Latour. Uh, Latour white burgundy. <laughs> yes, we did. But before we lose it, I, I want to point out that some of it just happened, and we're amazed that it happened. But one of the deliberate things that we all worked on was the land use and to try to preserve Oregon. And this place is, you know, it's going to be eaten up pretty soon. But we're hoping we can save some more of this because the vines have become so valuable to the state. So tourism has become so valuable that I think we've saved a lot of this land from uh, being turned into ticky tacky houses. Yeah. The reason we left California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're they're gaining on you. Yeah. They're gaining, but we, you know, we're kind of holding at least as long as we're here. And I think the kids, are, all of our kids, are totally dedicated to yeah. uh, uh, preservation of the land and, 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 you know, trying to make living conditions better. Well, for me, this has been really fun. To, well, I mean, we don't we don't create these opportunities for ourselves yeah. to 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 deal but, with. Well, do, don't you remember Diana Lett years and years ago, before <laughs> we were at all these ages? She said that we should invest in a big house, and then when we all get old, we can live in the house and talk to each other because nobody else wants to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Dave was doing now. <laughs> God, I, I hope that's not true. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's kind of a good idea. <laughs> the food would be good. The food and wine would be good. It would be good, yeah. <laughs> well, you've been through it all too, David. And you've, you've obviously mm -hmm. done an awful lot for the industry. And I'm flattered that you want to talk to us about it. But 
You were there at every moment of the, of the years that we were experiencing these things, and there were more than what we were talking about. Yeah. There were these trips to sell the wines as a group was, was really probably the most boring, but also very interesting as a, as a collection of wineries with Stephen Carey's operation. He dedicated so much time to that. And, uh, well, I, I think one thing for sure is we all, I mean, like we learned from each other at Steamboat about making wine yeah. on these sales trips, because we weren't by ourselves just telling our story, yeah. we were hearing from the others, yeah. how do you tell the common Oregon story? Yeah. How do you tell your own story within that? And uh, I bet we perfected selling by listening to each other. Yeah. Well, Pinot can. <laughs> Did we perfect yeah. selling? Well, we're <laughs> I don't know. Uh, 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 <laughs> not at the end game, no. But yes, you're right. Pinot camp. Was yeah, we couldn't afford airplanes to fly people in. Remember, I remember those discussions. Yeah. Well, like California, we yeah. couldn't, or, or our private plane to go around and visit. We could not do that. Uh, no. So no. we let them pay their own way to come. Yeah. So, so Pinot Camp was basically 250 people in the wine trade who had to pay to come, pay for their hotels, pay for their rental cars. Uh -huh. And listen to what's advertised to them for three days. Well, educate okay. them. Oh, yes, educate. That's well, what I'm and, and, and the, I mean, as I've compared Pinot Camp to other trips that people in the wine trade go on, I mean, you, you go to Spain and you go from one winery to the next, talking only to those winery people at that winery, yeah. and then you hear an unrelated story at the next one. I think the genius of Pinot Camp was that all the seminars were with multiple wineries. Yeah. <laughs> and we, it, it was replicating what we did on the, on the road. Yeah. We yeah, had to talk about that. We had to leave room for everybody who was speaking. Yeah. You couldn't just talk about yourself. And every now and then, somebody who really wasn't... <laughs> I remember those. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> every now and then, somebody would do their own trip and talk about how great they were. And, and not only did we kind of <laughs> look askance, yeah. but the campers got it too. They realized... That's not what Pinot Camp is about. No, no. It's about all these people working together. Yeah. And they forgot all the details <laughs> and remembered a collaborative industry yeah. when they left. Well, that's right. I'm going to drink one more. Okay. I think I, I th think I got a fruit fly, so oh, I'm not going no. to drink, but that's okay. I'll... I think a fruit fly in the wine is always a positive. <laughs> <laughs>